Line up in the morning and stare at your shoes Like meat for a gaffer to pick and to choose With a tap on the shoulder, he gives you the sign You can hump call all day for two shillings and nine I'm telling you Jack, life's not the same When you spend your day alone that hundred I worked in the office as a junior clerk all my life And unlike most people who work in the docks uh, My father was a builder's labourer and none of my family had ever walked in the docks. So me going out to the docks was like going out to a strange planet. So I lived in Archive Road, which is beside Talca Road and Barry Bock. At this, I was only there a bit like Miley, a few days. And this neighbour came to me and said, I want you to smuggle a pair of motorbike boots for me. And I says, what? He says, you go aboard a Polish ship and you get motorbike boots. So I says, okay. Again, what to be popular, I didn't even get the money up front. Uh, I went into work the next day and they told me that that Wednesday, the ship called the Stanagard Gdansky would be coming in. You go on board the Stanagard Gdansky and you ask for a pair of motorway boots. So I went aboard the ship, thankfully the crewman knew what I was talking about, brought me down into the crew's quarters, showed me around six different pairs of motorway boots. They asked me did I want vodka or other stuff as well. I said, no, just mold my boots. <laughs> I spent a tenner for mold my boots and I was going to take them out like I was in done stores. And he says to me, where are you going? You to stuff them down your, your trousers. So I stuffed them out of my, I thought this was a bit weird, stuffed them down my trousers, yeah, closed my jacket, walked down the gangway, and it was like a scene out of Statue and Hutch. Two carloads of customs officers came screaming to a halt. Uh, they told me to open my jackets. Oh, shit, wait, where did that come from? Uh, <laughs> so I noticed now the corner of my eye that a, a foreman on the deck was uh, Paddy Kelly. His father was Pat, Patty Kelly. He was Big Nose Kelly. So Paddy Kelly went by the name of Little Big Nose. <laughs> so the customs had given me a hard time, they said I was going to be charged, <coughs> I was going to be sacked, all about, all to do with these uh, motorbike boots. So Paddy Daly le leaned over the ship and started rowing at the, the customs officer. He says, that's Deco Bourne. Deco Bourne is half a gobshite. His wife is up the pole. <laughs> he can't afford a bus fare. He bought a motorbike. <coughs> and he doesn't even have a helmet. He needs the boots. So the customs fellas pulled back and they were getting into the car. A paddy can, I give him back his fucking boots. <laughs> so so they, they gave me back my boots. Mm -hmm. I brought them to the fellow on Talca Road and he said, I don't like the style of them. <laughs> so you'd think I'd have learned my lesson, uh, but I didn't. I discovered that the, the Polish boats also did a lovely vodka. The dockers told me I always go for Smirnoff. And then there was another brand called uh, Wodka Vodka. So I took a like into Wodka Vodka. Uh, it, it tasted much sweeter. But I'd say if there was Wodka Vodka on the market now, it would be nearly classified with headshot products. Because if you took a few glasses of Wodka Vodka, you, you, uh, happy. you went into spasms. So uh, th the methodology was the same. It had to go down uh, to be concealed. So I, I did that for a while. Uh, and then I learned all about the morality of smoking. Uh, <laughs> And as I say, uh, you better get a glass there. <laughs> and you ruin your trousers. <laughs> it's very complimentary, but it ruins your trousers. Uh, so, the, in all the years I was down there, I never saw a drug smuggled. But every other possible product I did, and there was a whole different attitude to smuggling. Even towards the end, uh, a doctor was caught commercially smuggling. 
and the union committee were able to argue that smuggling was a verbal warning. Robin was a second offence, but smuggling wasn't. So uh, I had the pleasure of working with that doctor and also a checker called uh, Bill Adegan, uh, who did, did very well uh, smuggling. But then there was a lower level of smuggling. If your daughter was getting married, it was totally acceptable for you to smuggle to save on the expenses. So I worked for a long time in the Ocean Pier, the Northwell Extension, and then I got sent over to South Bank, which was nicknamed Long Kesh, because if you sent over there, you never escaped. So Long Kesh was kind of <coughs> different again, because on the north side, uh, there was a crossover between dockers and checkers and office staff and mechanics, but the South Bank was much closer. You got to know everybody, everybody was great friends. So Joe Devlin coming up to his uh, daughter's wedding was caught with a forklift of pallet. And I think it was either six or eight car uh, cartons of vodka. And he was caught by a particular customs officer. I do have to check to make sure he's not here. <laughs> and the customs officer, even before this incident, was known as the Red Louse. Uh, he had red hair. And uh, he charged Joe. And the fine was way out of kilter, even for those days. I think it was three grand they got fined. So a doctor called Carmen McDermott went up to a printer's and uh, he got tickets printed for a raffle. Now there was absolutely no prizes in the raffle. And everybody in the docks bought a ticket, bar one man, there's always one. Mm -hmm. And uh, we came very close uh, to getting raised the three grand there thereabouts. <coughs> but a number of the dockers wanted to retaliate. Uh, one person suggested landing a container on the Red Louse's car. <laughs> and someone said, no, no, that's a bit extreme. Uh, I think we'll just take the petrol cap off and put a bag of sugar in. <laughs> so Joe heard this and he, uh, he came and he said, he called a meeting in the canteen. And he said, <coughs> I would really appreciate it if you took no action against this man. Uh, I don't want it on my conscience. I don't want you taking any action against the Red Louse. So everybody agreed to that and uh, kind of forgot about it. And then six weeks later, uh, there was a crew on South Bank that was supplemented. Every time there was a container ship, and there could be three of them, uh, anything from 21 to 30 dockers were allocated to the ships. So this docker on a Saturday afternoon walked <coughs> down to the terminal, came into the office and said, which one of you is, is Deco? So I said, yeah, that's me. He says, is it true that you're in walkie-talkie contact with the, the three ships, with the foreman, with the checkers? I said, yeah. Well, he says, I want the crowd but I want them all hidden behind containers. And I want the crowd in the next five to 10 minutes. And when you have the crowd, just give me, you have to stay inside the office, but just give me the thumbs up. <coughs> so I gave the thumbs up and uh, <coughs> proceeded to walk past the customs office, which was specially designed because it had a bigger window. And it was obvious to me that he had something concealed. Oh, I forgot. The, the Ducker's name was uh, Nudger Keating, and he had a nickname that any man would die for. Uh, his nickname was Big Nudger. So on that particular day, uh, it was obvious he was carrying something in his trousers. Uh, so he went past the customs office once, nothing happened. He went past the second time, and the red louse uh, appeared. He, did, he wasn't in uniform and he made a run at Nudger. And Nudger said to, Nudger made very little effort to escape, which is when it dawned on me, there was something strange going on. So the customs officer said to him, I, I'm arresting you under suspicion of smuggling. And uh, Nudger said, I know me rights, you could be anybody. You have no uniform, you have no ID. So your man ran back into the customs, came back in uniform, and Nudger Downey shimmied up around five feet. 
I said, this, this is not making sense. So he says to him, I'm arresting you for smoking and for suspicious smoking. And, uh, I don't want any arguments. I'm going to call the civil police. I said, you can call who you like. What makes you think I'm smoking them? And he says, oh, uh, you have spirits uh, on your person. So I've tried rehearsing this a few times, and I, I have been bad at it. <laughs> but in one movement, he opened a large bottle of Guinness. And to complete cheers from everybody, he started drinking the Guinness. And the customs officer asked him, what are you doing? And he says, I always like my Guinness at body temperature. <laughs> 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 The customs officer says to him, you're some bastard for humiliating me. Because the, the turkey man that was uh, there all came out with cheered, clapped. And he said back to him, not as big a pox as you were for doing Joe Devlin on his daughter's wedding. <laughs> the first time I'd done anything with the Dockers. And um, the only reference I really had to any Docker stories was um, an actor called Brendan Laird, who's living at the end of my road once told me about the blue funnel ship which his dad who was a docker uh, and all the lads on the street on Clan Road in Eastwald would go to so I put together a song about uh, a man who's kind of declaring his love for the blue funnel where he would get all of his goods Don't mind the rain or the rolling sea the weary night never worries me For the warmest time for a smuggler true Is to watch the funnel come into view So here's to you my bonny blue funnel line The finest ship bear sail the sea With hidden treasures for you and me And it's over the wall for to fill my path <coughs> as the sun comes up to warm my back so here's to you my bonny blue funnel line oh bring me gold and bring me pearls A bonny shawl For my bonny girl That when I come home I'll make no din And tell the boy That my ship's come in so here's to you, my bonny blue funnel line. If I had wings like Noah's dove, I'd fly the seas to the one I love. She's a rolling ship, blue as the main And I pine the day she comes back again So here's to you, my bonny
a bit mm -hmm. forward mm -hmm. to recite a poem he's read to, uh, written. Again, <laughs> if he becomes famous, I get 10% of the time. Is the sound okay up here? No, yeah. Produce the microphone. Produce the microphone. Okay. You can actually hear the better here. Do it in English, will you? I did my best. Actually, before I read the poem, I worked on the docks with these men for 40 years as a haulage contractor. I actually ha carried them half the time, and we had the great banter down the docks, you know. My father was a docker, and my father-in-law was a docker, and my grandfather was a docker. I was a casual docker for a couple of months a year in the 60s, as a cross-channel, for being oil. But um, I just remembered, <laughs> I just remembered the German sheds that's getting repaired up there at the moment, that's getting torn into a, a yuppie apartment or whatever it is. I think Dennis O'Brien has that place, has he? That's the rumour. Well, we used to walk out with them sheds sometimes. I think they're called the German sheds. What do you call it? Yeah. We had loading bags of linseed meal, and the docker, who was, I think he was retired, Airedale from Ring's End. Do you know? Small yeah, yeah. man. Johnny and Johnny Airedale says to me, he's, he's now elderly man at the time. He hey, forward, any chance of an old job? But I, I replied to him, I don't employ old men, I make them. <laughs> and he thought it was very funny himself, you know. But this poem I'm going to read out, my first poem, and the only poem I've written so far. It's to do with Anne Olivia. You know, the two heads that's down on the old banana stores, as we call them, the Tropical Fruit Company. It belongs to you too now and Paul McGuinness and all that. But the two heads that's there now at the moment, Atlantic and Anne Olivia, they once were on Carlisle Bridge. And when they straightened Carlisle Bridge out to make O'Connell Bridge in 1882, um, the heads were too big, so they put them down there on the Tropical Fruit Company. And we were down there, had our own bit of a deal there a couple of months ago. And I just got the idea, looking at the two heads of Anna Olivia. So I wrote this little poem called Heads in High Places. And it goes like this. Anna Olivia, you saw them come and go. With heads of hair covered in slack, coal dust and sweat that ran down wet and weary faces. Yes, you saw them come and go. When work was scarce and men on rainy days, standing on cobblestones, begged up the boss man's faces. Pick me, I'm your man. Pick me, please pick me. Yes, you saw them come and go. When sailing ships were moored and starving men like Pearl Hewers jumped aboard with number sevens on shoulders mounted high and without hesitation called their best mate and cried out loud, this hatch is mine for the taking. Yes, you saw them come and go. And when men were stripped to the waist while bushling wheat, corn and maize, you heard them cry out loud, there must be an easier way of making a living than breaking their backs for a lousy shilling. Yes, you saw them come and go. When kids came down from all corners of town with hunger in their faces, you just looked on without even a yawn and mumbled with granite faces, Dublin is going to blazes. Yes, you saw them come and go. And black 47 and starving people going to heaven, you hung low from Carlisle Bridge and not a toss it did you give. And the people cried out loud to the British nation, deliver us from starvation, as we are the dying nation, and we don't want any hunger on our doors. But the British with deaf ears gave us nothing but salt tears. Yes, you saw them come and go. Thank you. Four to drive it, one for to guide, four to fill it in the darkness inside. And he'll work like a miner, shoveling coal, scraping the floor deep down in the hole. I'm telling you, Jack, life's not the same when you spend your day alone at hundred tons.